Hello, I'm uh, Bernard Norcott Mahaney. I work at the Bluefoot branch of the Kansas City Public Library. April is National Poetry Month, and every April I <clears throat> read poems uh, daily, uh, read them aloud. Um, I've done this for a few years, and <clears throat> because we are in a month, uh, in a year where um, the Olympics are supposed to take place, um, at this point they are still not scheduled to appear. By the time these actually sh show up on YouTube, maybe not, but um, at any rate, it should be an Olympic year, and so I figured that what I would do is I would focus on poems that deal with uh, athletics. Um, the Greeks actually had a, <clears throat> uh, a genre of poetry. Uh, these were choral poems written for victors in athletic competitions. They, they're called Epinition Odes, uh, which just means for victory. And uh, <clears throat> there were poets, um, there were, you know, at least a handful of them who made their living pretty much by going uh, from town to town, um, uh, you know, convincing people who were going to compete in, in athletic competitions that should they win uh, in their event, um, they were available for hire to compose a poem in honor of the victor. Because the thing that the Greeks were big on was um, that humans are godlike to the extent that it is possible for humans briefly to achieve, at least certain humans, to achieve godlike status. And certainly like super athletes or any people at the top of their game uh, are people who would, who would have that appeal, right? So, um, and you would get your name on a plaque uh, at Olympia or at Corinth or in any of the other places that had these Pan-Hellenic games. But if you also got one of the top poets of the time to compose a victory poem that was then sung by a choir in your hometown, then that was a much bigger deal. And then, of course, that work survived. And the chief poet we have who wrote Epinition Odes was a guy named Pindar, and most of the poems we'll be looking at are by Pindar. Today's poem, we're going to look at a different poet uh, named Bacchylides. He came from an island called Chios, and uh, he also wrote uh, choral poetry, uh, like uh, Pindar. Uh, he had a, v a variety of uh, genres, though, and not just victory poems. But his ode number five, which is a victory ode, uh, is important because it actually deals with the same event that Olympia poem number one dealt with which is the victory of Hieron of Syracuse in the horse race at the Olympic Games in 476 BCE. So we've got the same event here dealt with by two different poets. So now, Bacchylides was Pindar's chief competitor uh, for contracts to write out. So they, they, they lived almost you know, the same length of time, um, end of the 6th century into... Uh, the fifth century. Um, the um, critics generally feel that Pindar was the better poet, but Bacchylides also was one of the poets that uh, was chosen as one of the chief lyric poets in Greece. Um, you know, by it like the by the Library at Alexandria. So this this guy's no slouch, um, but critics generally feel we, we have more of Pindar uh, and that Pindar generally is better. But this poem has some nice moments in it. Um, what uh, Bacchylides does the same sort of thing that Pindar does. What he does is he brings in some myth that has some connection. Now here, the myths that he um, alludes to, he talks about Heracles, Hercules, um, and he talks about Meleager. Uh, Meleager was a hero in the town of Caledon. Uh, he is most famous for a famous boar hunt uh, where he and a group of heroes hunted this uh, 
tremendously uh, large and destructive boar, uh, and he successfully killed the boar. Um, later, uh, he ended up getting involved in sort of a civil war with his uncles. He killed them, and then his mother um, had been presented by the gods with a log that as long as it stayed intact, um, Meleager would have a long and, uh, and successful life. Uh, she, in anger at her brother's death, uh, brothers, she, she lost two brothers uh, to Meleager, um, she takes the log and throws it in the fire, and as it burns, Meleager loses his strength. Um, he's in the, the middle of a battle, and he gets killed. So, um, but Kilmeny's point is that human um, excellence doesn't last. Even the greatest heroes eventually fail. Right? So that's the point. And even the Heracles in this, we don't see Heracles failing in this, but Heracles marries Deianira, who is Meleager's sister. It's Heracles' second wife. And Heracles uh, ends up getting killed, not intentionally, but ends up getting killed by that wife. So even though at this point things are still going great for Heracles in the story, um, the fact that we know he's going to marry Deianira and Deianira will kill him is an, another indication that even Heracles, the greatest of all the Greek heroes, his uh, power does not last. I mean, his power and his greatness does not last. Everyone, every you know, hero is going to fail. That's the nature of humanity. We are mortal. We are going to die. And so no matter how great things are going, things will eventually go downhill, unlike for the gods. All right, so, but what this poem then does is it provides that moment, like a snapshot of greatness when Heron had a really great day at Olympia. So, uh, this uh, poem uh, is in a translation uh, by Diane, um, by Diane Ar Arnson Svarlian. Uh, it's from the uh, Loeb Classical Library. Um, Bacchylides, unlike Pindar, does not have a lot of translators. Uh, this is a pretty good translation, though. So, Bacchylides, Ode number 5, Victory Ode to Hieron of Syracuse for winning the horse race at Olympia, 476 BCE. Fortunate in your fate, commander of the Syracusans, riders of whirling horses, you, if any man on earth today will rightly understand this honor, sweet gift of the violet garlanded muses. Now, calm your righteous mind, rest it from cares, and consider. A hymn, woven with the help of the deep-waisted graces, is sent from the holy island to your glorious city by your guest friend, the brilliant servant of Urania with her golden headband. He wants to pour forth his voice from his heart to praise Hieron, high above, slicing the deep air with his swift golden wings, the eagle, messenger of loud thundering wide ruling Zeus, trusts boldly in his powerful strength, and thin-voiced birds crouch in fear. The peaks of the great earth do not restrain him, nor the rough choppy waves of the untiring sea. In the everlasting void he shifts his delicate wings, riding the gusts of the west wind, a conspicuous sight for men. So now, for me, there are countless paths of song leading in every direction, thanks to dark-haired Nike and Ares with his bronze breastplate to sing of your excellence, noble sons of Danomenes. May the god not tire of doing good. Beside the wide whirling Alpheus, golden-armed Don saw the victory of the chestnut horse Pharaonicus, a runner swift as a windstorm, and she saw him win in, in very holy Pytho. Laying my hand on the earth, I make this declaration. Never in any contest has he been fouled by the dust of faster horses as he strained toward the finish line. In force, he is like Boreas. Obeying his rider, he speeds a new victory and new applause to hospitable Hieron. Prosperous is he to whom a god has given a share of fine things and a rich life to live out with enviable luck. For no man on earth was born to be fortunate in everything. 
So it was, they say, that the gate-destroying, unconquerable son of Zeus of the flashing thunderbolt went down to the halls of slender-ankled Persephone to bring up into the light from Hades the razor-toothed dog, son of the fearsome Echidna. There he saw the souls of miserable mortals by the streams of Cocytus, like leaves swirled by the wind along the sheep-pasturing headlands of shining Ida. Among them, the shade of Portheon's bold, spear-wielding descendant stood out. When the marvelous hero, son of Alcmene, saw him shining in his armor, he stretched the clear-sounding bowstring onto his bow and opened the lid of his quiver and drew out a bronze-tipped arrow. But the soul of Meleager appeared in front of him and spoke to him, knowing him well. Son of great Zeus, stand where you are and calm your spirit. Do not shoot a harsh arrow from your hands in vain against the souls of those who have perished. You have no need to fear. So he spoke, and the son of Amphitryon was astonished and said, What god or mortal raised such a fine young plant as you? In what land? Who killed you? No doubt Hera with her beautiful belt will soon send that killer after me. But that must be the concern of golden-haired Pallas. And Meleager answered him in tears, It is hard for men on earth to sway the minds of gods. For otherwise my father, horse-driving dri horse Aeneas, would have appeased the anger of holy white-armed Artemis with her garland of buds, when he entreated her with sacrifices of many goats and red-backed cattle. But the maiden goddess's anger was unconquerable. She sent an immensely violent boar, a ruthless fighter, to Caledon, the place of lovely choruses. There, his strength raging like a flood, he cut down vine rows with his tusk and slaughtered flocks and whatever mortals came across his path. We, the best of the Hellenes, fought hard to sustain the hateful battle against him for six days continuously. But when some god gave the upper hand to the Aetolians, we buried those whom the loud roaring boar had killed in his violent attacks. And Chius and Agelaus, the best of my dear brothers, whom Althea bore in the far-famed halls of Oeneus, Runa's fate destroyed. For not yet did the hostile goddess, the savage daughter of Leto, stop her anger. We fought hard for the beast's fiery hide, with the Caretes steadfast in battle. Then I killed, among many others, Iphiclus and noble Afaris, my mother's swift brothers. For strong-spirited Ares does not discern a friend in battle. Shafts fly blindly from the hands against the souls of the enemy and bring death to whomever the god wishes. My mother, the hostile daughter of Thestius, did not take this into account. She brought about my evil fate, the fearless woman, and planned my destruction. She took the log of my swift doom out of the ornate chest and burned it. Fate had marked off that this should be the boundary of my life. I happened to be slain Climinus, Diipolis' valiant son, whose body was flawless. I had overtaken him in front of the towers. The others were fleeing to the well-built ancient city of Pluron, and my sweet soul diminished. I knew that my strength was gone. Ay, ay! I breathed my last breath in tears as I left behind splendid youth. They say this was the only time that the son of Amphitryon, fearless in battle, ever wetted his eyes with tears, pitying the fate of the man who had endured grief. And he answered him in this way, For mortals it is best never to be born, never to look on the light of the sun. But there is no profit in lamenting this. One must speak of what can be accomplished. Is there, in the halls of battle-loving Oeneus, any daughter, unsubdued by love, whose appearance is like yours, I would gladly make her my splendid bride. And to him the soul of Meleager, steadfast in battle, answered, I left behind at home Deianira, with a neck like fresh olive. Golden Cypress, charmer of mortals, is still unknown to her. White-armed Calliope, stop your well-made chariot right there. Sing of the Olympian ruler of the gods, Zeus, son of Cronus, and the untiring stream of the Alpheus, and the strength of Pelops, and Pisa, 
where glorious Pharaonicus won victory in the race with his feet and returned to Syracuse with its fine towers, bringing to Hieron the leaf of good fortune. For the sake of truth we must give praise, pushing away envy with both hands, if any mortal does well. A Boeotian man, Hesiod, attendant on the sweet muses, said this, He whom the gods honor has a good name among men as well. I am easily persuaded to send to hear on my illustrious voice, not from the path. For in this way the roots of fine fortune flourish. May the great father Zeus guard them undisturbed in peace. So that was Bacchylides, Ode Number 5, the victory ode for Hieron of Syracuse in the horse race at the Olympiad in uh, 476 BCE.